taking the stage right now is Min Post writer Jay Wiener, who has an interview this morning right here on the stage with Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Lori Gilday. We can have a round of applause for them. Thank you, Jay, and Supreme Court Justice Lori. Are we on? Are we on? Yes, you are. Good to see you. Good How about morning. Me? Okay, great. This is the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court, Lori Gilday, and uh, when I told people I was going to interview you here, uh, almost to a person, they said, we, we don't know anything about her at all, that she's brand new. Some people said you're a conservative member of the court. We'll get to that later. But I did some research and found out you're from Plummer, Minnesota, yes. population 270. Yes. What does growing up in a small town inform uh, a justice of the Supreme Court? What, what do you bring from a small town to the highest court? Well, thanks for that question, Jay. The most important thing to know about me is that I am always and only a girl from Plummer, Minnesota. Uh, growing up in an environment like that, it, it's a very safe environment to grow up in. My mom and dad still live there. Um, and I think in terms of what I bring, uh, to my professional life from growing up there, it's really a sense of, of community and an understanding that when you live in a small place like that, everybody works or nothing does. And that sense of community and everybody being in the same boat and rowing in the same direction, I think is very, very important now. But the cases that you see at the Supreme Court, how many still have rural roots to them or are we a more suburban uh, and urban culture and therefore things that you learned in Plummer don't apply anymore? Well, I certainly think things I learned in Plummer continue to apply. Um, in terms of cases that come before the court, one of the things that we look at when we're making decisions, whether to take review in a case, because we are at the Supreme Court largely a court of discretionary review, which means that Many of the cases, not all, but many of the cases that we decide are ones that we've chosen to decide, ones that we pick. And one of the things that we think about when we're picking is, is this a case of statewide importance? Is this going to affect people in Plummer and Worthington and Roseau and Duluth and Minneapolis? And so it is a very statewide um, um, Im impact, if you will, that we look to. Just to get this out of the way, um, I read that you are a reigning competitor. Yes. And that you are a horse person. This is the state fair, so we should talk a little bit about that. Yes. What is reigning? Reigning is a western sport, which means that we ride with western saddles, the kind that have a saddle horn. Uh, it's a sport, it's the fastest growing equestrian sport in the country right now, and it's a sport that grew up based on the moves that horses make when they herd cattle. So there's some dramatic spins and turns, and, and uh, it's a very dramatic sport when it's done well. Uh, it's not dramatic when I do it. It's sort of slow and plodding. <laughs> and do, you, do you actually compete? I do. Not well, but I do. We had a, my, the conference that I show and had our big show a couple of weeks ago here uh, at the Hipp Hippodrome. And how did you do? I placed third um, in my class. And yes, before you asked, there were more than three people in the class. Um, and so it was, a good, it was a good day for me. And I saw one thing that I saw is where one of the tricks, or is it called a trick? Or, or, or we call them maneuvers. Maneuvers. It's actually get the horse to sit. Yes. Well, you. It's a sliding stop, and they wear the horses wear um, they wear shoes, of course, and they wear special shoes on their back feet that are called sliders, and they're filed down a little bit. That facilitates the horse sliding. So you get the horse running, and it's important that they be accelerating when you say whoa and then the horse's back legs collapse a little bit and it looks like they're almost sitting. And then they pedal along with their front feet and come to a stop. And then you gallop them off and you turn 180 degrees and gallop them off in the other direction. And the only other question is when they mark you, can you appeal? <laughs> no. no. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just last May, you became the Chief Justice, actually June 30th, but you were it was announced. I was in sworn May. in July 1st, yes. Um, when you move from Associate Justice to Chief Justice, what changes uh, besides your office and your title? What sort of new responsibilities do you have and what new power do you have? 
Well, the Chief Justice is the administrative head of the judicial branch of government, which is one of the branches of government. And so I have administrative responsibility over the branch. We have approximately 2,900 employees, a $300 million budget every year. And so I get to go to a lot more meetings. Um, the policy making body for the branch is called the Judicial Council. It's made up of 25 people from around the state and I preside over the Judicial Council. So there's additional administrative responsibility. There's also uh, more outreach opportunity, which I very much enjoy. Now, it's my understanding that when a case is heard, there's a conference afterwards. Yes. And the Chief Justice gets the last shot, as it were, around the table. Is, is that true or, or not? Yes, it's, it, it is true that the speak the chief speaks last. We are very much an institution of order at the Minnesota Supreme Court, and we do every everything we do, we do in order, and the order we go in depends on what function we're performing that day. But in terms of conferencing the cases, um, the way it works is we hear oral argument in the case, and as soon as the argument is over, the seven of us go back into the conference room and we decide the case that same day. And we the conferencing begins with an oral report, which is really just an oral summary by the justice to whom the case had been assigned beforehand. And then we go around the room in order of reverse chronological order, if you will. So let's just put this in terms of when I was an associate justice, okay? And we'll hypothesize that you're a member of the court and that you're a junior member to me, which means you came on after I did. Let's just pretend. So the case is assigned to me, we have the oral argument, then the seven of us go back to the conference room. I give the oral report, what happened in the case, how I think the case should come out. And then as the junior justice to me, then you would speak next. And you'd say whether you agree or disagree with what I've recommended for the outcome. And then we go around the room in order, and there's nobody junior to you in my hypothetical here, so it would go to Justice Page who's the most senior colleague, and so on and so on, and then the chief speaks last. And so, have you had conferences since you took over? Yes. And is it, what happens now that you're the chief justice? Is, is there power in that, or, or, or not? Well, you know, there, there, so somebody has to run the meeting, and, and I don't consider it, um, you know, it's not a power thing. I mean, I'm one of seven. When the court is deciding cases, we are seven equal voices, and my voice might start the discussion or end the discussion, but it's no more powerful than anybody so, else's so, voice. So you don't think the last word matters at all? Well, I think it can, depending upon the circumstance. I mean, the obligation of the chief also is to try to uh, distill the conversation and, and, and move it on. Um, and so there is some, I suppose, value in that. When I started, I said that people didn't know anything about you, but they say, oh, she's one of the more conservative members of the court. What do you think about that assessment? Is that fair? Does it offend you? What, what are your thoughts? You know, I don't get into labels, conservative, liberal, because I don't think they're meaningful. They don't describe what we do on the court. We don't look at the cases that come before us based on conservative, liberal. We're the people's court. We are the justices for liberals, conservatives, middle, lizard people, Green Party, whoever they are. I mean, we are their court, and we decide the cases based on the facts that are presented in those cases and the law that applies to those cases um, without regard to, to uh, favor for anyone. I think I was appointed because of my record of experience. Now, last week, you spoke to the Criminal Justice yes. Institute, and uh, you said it's up to us to help the people that see an insufficiently funded justice system will impact them in their com communities. And then you said, we are on the brink. Wh what do you mean that we're on the brink in, within the justice system? What, how, how bad is it? And what brink are we on? Well, the funding decisions made by the other branches of government have consequences. The, the justice system is promised in our Constitution. I mean, one of the first things that our founders said in the Constitution, not to get too geeky or wonky here, but if you open up the Constitution, one of the first things you see there is government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of the people. That's the justice system. And 
over the last couple of years, the funding decisions made by the other branches of government have left us in the justice system 10% short of the people we need to do the work. So you just think about running any other kind of business with 10% fewer people than you need to do the work. That has had an impact. We are seeing around the state now public service windows closed. People come and they want to pay their traffic ticket or they have a question about something and the, pub and the window is closed because we don't have the people there. One out of three serious felonies in our state is taking more than a year to get to trial. That's too long. Victims' lives are on hold during that period of time. Defendants' lives, defendants' families' lives are on hold during that period of time. That's too long. And that's not what the people expect, and that's what I meant. So, what can you do? Well, I think we have to take our case to the people. We have to make the people understand that the justice system has five million constituents. Every person in Minnesota has a stake in ensuring that the justice system is functioning efficiently and fairly. And so I intend to do that. Wherever two or more are gathered, including here at the fair, I want to talk to the people about it. Because, you know, let's be honest, Jay, people don't want to come to court. They don't want to have anything to do with us. We don't see people on their best days. We see, see people because something has gone wrong in their life. Maybe their family needs to go through a divorce. Maybe somebody in their family has been accused of a crime. Maybe their business has a contract that's not being enforced. And, and so they don't want to think about us, but they have to think about us because we have to be there for them when they need us. We have a budget crisis in the state. It, it's been in all the papers. You yes, think. I've read about it. <laughs> and so um, how do you resolve this conflict of, of uh, needing to have justice when the resources are limited, and no matter who wins this race coming up, uh, he is going to have to probably trim some things. How, how, how do you, how does that work out? Well, first, I don't think there's a conflict. In other words, the, the, the political branches don't have to choose between funding the justice system and funding something else. We are about 2% of the state budget. So, so to say there's some conflict or some choice, you know, it, it's either this or that, I don't accept that premise. I mean, the, 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 the other part of the message is that the people expect good government. And we are good government in the justice system. We've made great innovations. We have now a statewide case information system. That sounds wonkish, but let I me saw tell it on you. The web. It, it looks interesting. I mean, let me tell you what it means yeah. practically. What it means is that a judge in Red Lake County who's got a defendant in front of her can look up and see has this defendant been in Hennepin County? Is there an outstanding warrant in, in Ramsey County? Um, what's going on in St. Louis County with this defendant? Our partners in law enforcement can look up now and see, well, what are the conditions? This person has been sentenced. What are the conditions of probation? They don't have to call and get voicemail and call back. They can just look it up right away. We have 50,000 data exchanges every day. I, it's, it's certainly, yes, it does. It makes us safer. It makes us more efficient. Um, and so that's one piece of it. We also have um, a virtual self-help center now to try to help folks who come to court and they're not able to afford lawyers, which that's the reality for more and more people now. And so you can look up from your home computer if you have one or from the courthouse computer if you don't have one and you can get help with, most of the, with, with many of the most commonly filed kinds of cases. Um, and so we're trying to do government better in the justice system, and I think that's an important piece of the message as well. They want me to have this question, but I have one more, and that yep. is this. You've talked about a grassroots campaign. Yes. And lawyers, even though I'm married to one, are generally not that popular these days, I would say. But I don't know if they, how they rank with journalists or you know, politicians, but they're not the most popular. How, how do you get a grassroots campaign, um, and how do you lead this campaign, I guess, without uh, conflicts and cases that you see or without looking like you're too activist in some ways? Well, you know, I think lawyers should be popular. 
if, if I can just argue with your premise a little bit. I mean, if they're not popular, I think they should be popular. America was built in large part because of lawyers. Go back and look at who our founders were. A lot of them were lawyers. When people have really difficult problems, they come to lawyers for help. So being a lawyer is a good thing. Um, and so I don't accept that premise. Um, I'm and, not saying and, it's bad, I'm just saying yeah, well, I think they're not popular. <laughs> well, and, and maybe we need to do a better job of talking about what lawyers really do do and how important they are to society. But clearly, I'm not going to take my case to the people only through lawyers. I mean, everybody has a stake in this and everybody needs to understand lawyers, plumbers, taxi cab drivers, farmers, um, gas truck drivers, which is what my dad was. I mean, everybody has a stake in this conversation. Was there a question somewhere? Some, somebody said there was. Don, is there a question? No? Maybe we answered it. We can hope. No, um, Justice, Chief Justice Magnuson, who you succeeded, yes. um, was on a pretty public, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't as grassrootsy as I think you were talking about, but he held a news conference over at the Capitol. He went around the state. Yes. He formed a coalition with uh, county attorneys and police officers. Um, do you have time to do what he did, and, and are, uh, should we assume that your campaign will be modeled after what he did, or how, how will yours be a little different? The crisis is more intense now, it seems like. Yes, and, and, and I, I very much appreciate Chief Justice Magnuson's advocacy for the court system, and I think the coalition that he started is a wonderful building block for me. Um, it, it focused very much on the criminal justice system, and we haven't talked about the crisis in funding that our public defenders are facing, but of course that's very real and is part of the whole conversation. I intend to continue that effort and build on it. I'm hoping to expand the coalition. I'm hoping to involve the business community, um, I'm, because they do have a stake in this. They need to get their contracts disputes resolved promptly. If they want to expand their business in Minnesota and there's, let's say they want to buy a piece of property and there's a cloud on the title and they yeah. got to get that thing cleared away so they can buy the property and build the plant and build the widgets. They need, they need to know that their cases are going to get resolved quickly. They have a stake in this conversation. I mean, my message really is we have five million constituents. We are unlike most other things in Minnesota. Every single person has a stake in uh, ensuring and, that our system functions. And again, how do you reach out in your job without, I'm making this up, you reach out to the downtown council in yes. Minneapolis uh, about this and suddenly uh, Target or, uh, Nor or Wells Fargo's got a case in front of you. Any issues or problems with that? Well, I think if you go to a civic organization and you speak about funding the justice system, I mean, that is a message that applies to everybody. It's not case specific. It's not about your particular dispute or my particular dispute. It's about the promise of equal access to justice. And we do have recusal rules, of course, that we all um, apply to our own individual situation. And if the, the standard is really, would a reasonable person have a basis to believe that we couldn't be fair and impartial in an, in, in, in an individual case? And that's the standard that, that governs us. So finally, I know you did this speech, but um, when will we see you next? Or what, uh, is, there, is a campaign being planned? Are you and people like John Castoris putting a plan together? Or what, the, what, the, when will you kick off the, the grassroots campaign? Well, I consider it to have been kicked off. <laughs> um, but the Coalition to Preserve the Justice System is meeting in September. Um, our legislative advisory work group has begun meeting. Mm -hmm. And so you will be hearing a lot from us early and often as we move on here. Have any other thoughts or points that you want to make? We didn't talk about the public defenders, and I heard you on radio the other day. I know you can't talk about that case that yes. went through in a southeastern county, I forget what county. Steel County, I think. Um, but uh, not being able to speak about the case, you, what is the crisis among PDs in the state? Is it real? They are, they have laid off many, many, many people around the state and their public defenders are carrying um, many multiples of the number of cases that they should be carrying. And so I think it is a real issue facing our state. In terms of the criminal justice system, we often describe it as a three-legged stool. 
The prosecutor is one leg, the judge is the other leg, and the third leg is the public defender. And we all know what happens when the legs aren't equal. So we start shaving off more and more and more from the public defenders, and the stool doesn't stand. It's a very real issue confronting us. I still get back to the question of how are we going to do it with the, the, with the crisis that we have in uh, the state with money. Um, are you confident that you can at least maintain that 2% that you, you've got? Or well, I'm going to do everything I can to, to make the case. I mean, we are, and I, and I think part of the case has to be the innovations that we've been undertaking. I mean, we recognize in the justice system that we can't keep doing justice the same way we've been doing it. We have to use technology more, and we are. We have e-charging now, and e-filing is being rolled out in Hennepin County in the next few months. We have to use technology more and more in the delivery of our services. So